Good morning, friends, and welcome to worship at Chula Vista Presbyterian Church, where our mission is to know Christ and to make him known. Just a couple of announcements before we get started. Pastor Emily is on vacation still. She'll return next week, and we will not have communion this Sunday, but that's been per session postponed until next Sunday. Our speaker this morning, I think, is a very familiar face to all of us. He's our organist and choir master, Dan Hersher. And he'll be delivering his message in music and in the Word of God. If you like the talk, if you like the talk back message that's being screened on YouTube each week, then see Albert after the service. And if you need the support of a pastor during Emily's absence, then contact David McElrath at the Grand Memorial Presbyterian Church. So again, let us turn our hearts to worship the Lord. If able, I invite you to stand and join together in the call to worship as found in the bulletin. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. Let us come and sing to the Lord, and shout with joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into God's presence with thanksgiving and sing joyful songs of praise. Come, let us worship the Lord. Now let's join together in our opening hymn, number 483, sing praise to God who reigns above.
may be seated. <clears throat> Let's join in our prayer of confession. Friends, as we gather our thoughts into quietness, let us confess our sins to the one who knows us best. Gracious God, our judge and our redeemer, we confess that we worship things rather than you. We have lived for our own glory, cutting ourselves off from you. We ask that you forgive us our sins and free us from selfishness, that we may delight in your will and follow in your paths through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Hear now our personal confessions in the quiet of this moment. In Jesus' name, amen. The assurance of pardon. In this we have assurance of God's forgiveness. While we were sinners, we were reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. Amen. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven, signed with the Spirit, lavished with gift upon gift, released into hope to live for praise and for glory. Please stand. I think this is on. Would you please join me in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, the Master Director of all that is good and beautiful in this world, let us push out the noisy sounds of the world from our thoughts so we can hear your quiet, still, sweet voice commanding us to sing your praises and thanksgiving. Tune our hearts in consonance with your commandments. Give us ears to listen, voices to praise, and hearts to understand. Forgive us our wrong notes that clash with the harmony of your world. Tune us and make us instruments of your peace. Let us live so we can experience the glory and majesty 
of heaven with the saints above, voices raised in praise to you. We ask this in the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray using these words, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy world be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now as we open our hearts to God's word, let us stand and sing hymn number 220. All people on earth do dwell. Testament reading this morning comes from Psalm 98, the entire 98, and it's found on page 551 in your pew Bible, and I encourage you to follow along with me. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gotten him victory. The Lord has made known his victory. He has revealed his vindication in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the victory of our God. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre, with the lyre and the sound of melody, with trumpets and the sound of the horn. Make a joyful noise before the King of the Lord. Let the sea roar and all that fills it the world and those who live in it. Let the floods clap their hands. Let the hills sing together for joy at the presence of the Lord, for he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and people with equity. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The uh, scripture reading today is from Paul's Letter to the Church at Colossus, verses three, or verse three, chapter three, verse sixteen. Christ's message in all its richness must live in your hearts. Sing psalms, hymns, and other sacred songs. Sing to God with thanksgiving in your heart. I have a confession to make to you. 
I love Facebook. <laughs> Through Facebook, I have been connected to an entire world of people's posts just crying out for my piercing wit, amusing commentary, bad puns, and yes, dad jokes. Through Facebook, I am connected to a large number of groups with a variety of interests from organ playing and organists to organ building, model steamboats and steam engines, American history, but perhaps my favorite group is the Art Deco Motor and Fashion Group. This, this group, of course, concerns itself with the wonderful cars and clothing from the 20s, 30s, and 40s. With surprising frequency, someone will post an old family photo on this group of long gone <clears throat> ancestors standing by the family vehicle and they will post the question, can anyone identify the car? And I always answer, it's the big metal thing with wheels. <laughs> what does this have to do with singing? Probably not very much. But I have your attention now, don't I? It feels pretty good not to just be preaching to the choir. The, uh, the basic premise of Facebook is connection, I think. And that is what underlies our need to sing. Singing connects us to many things and in many ways. Those of you that were <clears throat> expecting a technical, dis technical discussion of music, you might get a little bit of that. Those of you that were expecting a history of church music might get a little of that too. But what I'm hoping you get out of my talk this morning is an understanding of why song is a vital part of our, our culture, our society, and our church. First of all, singing connects us individually. We don't really know when singing started, but every human culture on earth has developed some tradition of singing. I'm guessing that singing and language probably developed simultaneously, and you can hear that in, in many languages. In some languages, the words pitched high or low have different meanings. Some language, languages have a very musical sound to them. Have you ever heard Italian spoken in a monotone, except maybe by German tourists? I doubt anyone has. I like to think that even as language was in its infancy, people made song around the nightly campfire, maybe just so they'd have an excuse not to listen to Uncle Marty's Mastodon hunting stories again. It might not have had lyrics, but you don't always need lyrics to make that connection with, with music and singing. A melody, even without words, can make that connection. Perhaps a demonstration. If you will all please hum with me when I get started.
Songs connect us as individuals to our past. And the same song may have different meanings to different people. A song of victory has a very bitter taste to the losing side. Songs that bring up joyful memories to one person maybe bring up tragedy to others, but they still make a connection. Connections to the history of our country, to our individual history, and to our family history. I still remember a few songs my great-grandmother, Ida Wold, would sing when she could be persuaded to get out her guitar. Most of them are what she called tear jerkers, songs that tell a tragic story, sometimes with a happy ending and sometimes not. And I remember singing to pass time on family trips in the car. And I'm sure a lot of the songs that we sang, you guys sang also. Most of us readily recall our high school and college fight songs and alma maters. Um, my particular, my particular case, uh, Navy Blue and Gold, the Army, uh, the the alma mater of the Naval Academy, uh, always takes me back to my years spent in Annapolis. And most people, I think, feel the same way that I do, even if they won't admit it. Most of us have memories of songs sung at weddings and birthdays, homecomings, graduations, funerals. I've played a, a few memorial services, and there have been very few where the family did not come armed with at least a song or two that were meaningful to their late family member asking us to play or sing them. Many of our earliest memories are of songs that our mothers sang us to get us finally and blessedly to go to sleep. Many of us belong to organizations that have their own songs, and these songs remind us of all of those who had gone before us. Each state has its own song. Does anyone remember the name of the California state song? Only those who heard my sermon at the first service. I love you, California. It's terrible. It's no wonder we don't sing. It was written in 1912 and sounds like it. So songs provide us with connections as individuals. Song connects us to memories, family, friends, places, and groups that help us become, have helped us to become who we are. Songs also connect us as groups. How many of you have sung in a choir or chorus in school or at church or as part of a community group? I promise I'm not taking down names. Let's see a show of hands. You got those names down, Lisa? <laughs> when you sing with a group, you form an immediate bond with all of those you are singing with. You don't have to be a great singer for a lot of groups. Auditioning for the Metropolitan Opera Chorus, maybe, certainly not for most church choirs. And most people who claim they can't sing will still try to join in at the with the national anthem at a ball game and always, always, always sing Take Me Out to the Ball Game, regardless of how their team is doing by the seventh inning. Please stand. Yes, when I became a church organist, some ballpark missed out on a great ballpark organist. <laughs> we established that immediate connection at a ball game with the people around you, even if you have no idea who they are. 
and uh, between the shared experience of the ball game and the singing, we're a group. Singing with the group gives us an opportunity to participate, even if not all of the contributions are equal. We can't all be child prodigies, brilliant singers with three octave ranges, able to see, sight read vocal music with ease. We have had many members in our own choir who claimed, true or otherwise, not to be able to read music. You can learn music by rote. That is how songs were passed down for centuries. We didn't have systems of writing down music until the Middle Ages, and these were mainly developed by the church, and they were not interested in writing down folk songs, sung histories, ballads, and other music. Those were handed down still by rote. When I was with the uh, Naval Academy Glee Club, we had several Beach Boys numbers that you had to learn by singing with the people around you who had sung them for years before. As far as I know, no one ever produced a written piece of music for those pieces. You just had to learn them. So, uh, so far what I've presented to you are reasons why music makes connections to us as humans. Connections are made as individuals to our family histories, national origins, important times and days in our lives. We also make connections with groups through singing, at school, fraternal organizations, the scout, uh, that's a free plug for you, Bill, and at church. Now I'd like to talk about the last one. Why do we sing in church? You can hold a perfectly meaningful church service without music. The only question that brings to my mind is why would you? Uh, I'm, if the, uh, the option for some sort of music existed, I'm sure that most of us would choose to have it. Perhaps the most important reason that we sing in church is that the Bible tells us to. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Praise him on the timbrel and the harp with stringed instruments and the organ, etc., etc. The, the verses are numerous, and especially in the Psalms in the Old Testament. In the New Testament they exist, but a lot of them are kind of in passing. When they, had, when they had finished, they sung a hymn and then went out, or words to that effect. We have come to accept that music, sung music especially, is an intrinsic part of the worship experience for us. It's not something new. In the Old Testament, the Psalms were intended to be sung. And if you read the texts of the Psalms, there are numerous overwhelming references to singing. Selecting an Old Testament lesson for today was not easy, not because they were hard to find, but because there's so many psalms that touch on singing. There aren't any written records of what tunes were used in the early church to sing the psalms, but I imagine that they were tunes that everybody knew, as long as they fit the rhythm of the poetry. And that's what the psalms are, poetry. And that's why there's so much music that, were, that uses text from the psalms. In the medieval church, psalms and other texts were sung by the monastic orders of the church at all of their services throughout the day and the night. And although there were handwritten books of psalms, and some of which include, included musical notation, those were very expensive and fairly rare. Music was, to a large degree, still taught by rote. The fitting of psalms to the tunes was probably done something like the method used in the metrical index of tunes in the back of our hymnal. Has anyone ever wondered what all of those indexes are for? Especially one that says metrical index. What is that? Well, the meter of a hymn is a system for counting the syllables in the lyrics. And as long as a hymn has the same metrical index as another hymn, you can use their lyrics and tunes interchangeably. Perhaps a small example. Eternal Father, strong to save, whose arm doth bind the restless wave, 
who bids the mighty ocean deep its own appointed limits keep. Oh, hear us when we cry to thee for those in peril on the sea. Of course, all of you, I'm sure, recognize the lyrics to the Navy hymn sung to the tune of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, and it works, sort of. You have to be a little careful doing that, or you end up with awkward phrases like, Oh, hear us when, and things like that. Uh, so if you're going to change the, the melody and the, and the hymns, play through it once and see if it makes sense. Human voices were a very important part of the early church experience, and this practice continued up through the Renaissance when musical instruments were finally introduced into the services. Uh, the, music, the medieval church kept music alive, and again, this is when we start finding systems for annotating music for the purposes of songs being sung in churches and monasteries. So we sing to offer praises to our God just as the early church did. Musical styles change, but the purpose does not. We also sing to pass on the great stories from the Bible. Many of our hymns are retelling of themes, ideas, commandments. Many of the hymns are Trinitarian, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, offering praise to the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit with a verse for each. Many of the lyrics for our hymns come from the pens of the great hymn writers of our faith, both past and present. Singing allows us to give expression to the concept and honor the thoughts of these saints of the church. I strongly recommend next time you come in for services here, sit down and read the words to the hymns before we sing them. They, it'll help you give, an, give you an idea of what the writer was trying to express. So to sum all of this up, why do we sing? We sing because it connects us as individuals to our own personal history. It connects us to each other through the shared experience of singing and because we have been directed to do so in many, many places in the Bible. This connects us to something that we are commanded to do. I've had a lyric running in my head since I started writing this sermon. It's the last verse to Amazing Grace. When we've been here 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Isn't that perhaps the best description of eternity that you've ever heard? Number 280 in your hymnal, the last verse. And uh, I can't think of any better way to end this sermon. Amen. No, no, no. Offertory. This is our offertory. We're collecting the offering in the back as, we, um, as we've done for a number of months now. So 
this is an opportunity for you to listen and reflect.
last announcement, there will be a congregational meeting next Sunday at 945 to elect church officers. And now, let's bow in prayer. Please, Lord, let us go from this place with the music of thanksgiving in our hearts and songs of praises on our lips. Amen. And I gotta play the poster too.